starting with Mel Gold, Kamal Lexi, and then continue with uh, Jet Sunma and Sri Pao. Uh, to make it short, please. Um, untuk para hadirin, tema hari ini adalah perlindungan tentang belas kasih atau uh, compassion. Ya, marilah kita dengarkan uh, ceramah Dharma setelah sesi dari uh, kedua tokoh kita. Kita akan lanjutkan dengan tanya jawab. Ya, terima kasih. Nih, Let's begin by generating a pure motivation for listening to the Dharma teachings. It's not easy to get Dharma teachings. In ancient India and in Tibet, sometimes they have no paper. They have to cut skin from their arm and write the lines of the Dharma on, in blood on their own skin because no paper, right? So we're so fortunate These days we have lots of paper and lots of Dharma books sitting on the shelves in our homes and our libraries. But actually to get even one line of teachings, Dharma teachings, is a very precious opportunity. So let's take refuge in the three jewels and generate a pure motivation for listening to the teachings. If you know the prayer, please sing along. Sangye chidam sukhi chonala Changchu padu dhani kyam suchi Tagi jen sohaki pesanam ki Tola tenshe sangye tuparsho Because 
We Christians talk a lot about compassion, but we don't really have a method for developing compassion. We don't know the steps uh, to develop this important quality. So they, the Catholics, the Christians, appreciate the Buddhist teachings because there they can learn systematically how to develop compassion. Now the definition of compassion is wishing to relieve the sufferings of all living beings. We all have sufferings, various kinds of sufferings. The suffering of birth, the suffering of sickness, the suffering of old age, the suffering of death. We have the suffering of getting reborn again and again and again in the various realms of rebirth. Getting born as a god, which is pleasant at the time, but then our heavenly rebirth comes to an end. And they say that the gods suffer more in those last few days when they realize that they're going to fall to a lower realm than even the babies in the hell realms. Because it's such a, a change. Right? It's a shock. The sufferings of the demigods, they're the jealous fighting gods. Very proud, very arrogant. Yeah? And they can't get along together. Kind of like some humans. <laughs> so, then we have the sufferings of the human one. We are very familiar with those. But when we're young and beautiful and rich, we don't think about them much. It's only when we get some terrible illness. I just heard a story about a young man in her 20s who had a serious stroke. Imagine having a stroke at when you're still in your twenties. And so illness can come at any time. The sufferings of not only for ourselves, the various sufferings, but the accidents and so forth, but also to our family members and our friends. So we we can become familiar, it's important to be familiar with the sufferings that human beings experience. We don't want to think about them, but it's important to think about them. Because after all, if we don't understand suffering, we won't make much progress on the path. Mm -hmm. And suffering, of course, you felt was the Buddhist first noble truth. So we better get familiar with it. Then there's the sufferings of the animals. The animals look like they're having a good time. You know, flying around, chasing each other and flying in the sky and swimming in the water. But when you think about it, the sufferings of the animals are tremendous. They don't have any real freedom because they're always getting chased. Little fish are getting chased by the bigger fish. The birds are getting attacked by the bigger birds. And they have to suffer a lot trying to find enough food. And we're not talking about our pet dogs and kittens here. We're talking about the rest of the animals the vast majority of the animals, the vast majority of sentient beings, which are insects, right? The insects, we don't really think about all the sufferings that they experience. When we get bitten by a mosquito, we only think of our suffering, right? But we don't think about the suffering of this poor mosquito, who is trying so hard uh, just to find a bite to eat. So that's why they bite us. <laughs> but often they'll get and that's the end. Then we think about the sufferings of the hungry ghosts. Oh, these are tremendous. The hungry ghosts are always looking for something to eat or drink. They don't have a flesh body, so they can't really enjoy anything. They are tormented by hunger and thirst. So you'll notice in Chinese temples around 11 o'clock, they offer some food to the hungry ghosts. And the hungry ghosts feel so happy when they see them. But then when they go to try to eat it, oh, they can't. They don't have a body. And if they take it in, the liquids turn to like molten iron. And they burn all the way down. So the sufferings of this iron. Basically, we're talking about the sufferings of greed and stinginess. So, even when people get what they're looking for, they're not satisfied. And the hungry ghost realm 
It's really serious. So they are constantly tormented by hunger and thirst. That's why they hang out where people are having a good time, but they never get any satisfaction. Then the sufferings of the hell realms. If people don't want to hear about the hell realms, but when we think about it, all religions talk about hell beings, and the hell realms. And interestingly, they all describe them in similar terms. Can you understand my English? Is it okay? Oh, good. Okay. So, they talk about the sufferings of the hell realms. I'm sure you want me to go into detail, right? Okay, so, the sufferings of the hell realms. Oh boy. There's a forest where the trees have leaves like razor blades. And you have to pass through the forest, and as you move through the forest, you get chopped, sliced by the leaves of the trees, repeatedly. And then you pass out from the pain, and then you revive again, only to get sliced again by more razor blades. Now this might sound like mythology. Maybe it's just a fairy tale to make us behave better. But if we keep an open mind, it's also possible that it's real. So now these days in the United States, I'm from the United States, just someone's from England, and many people there say, oh, Buddhism works just as well without believing in karma, without believing in rebirth. Yeah, it's a very popular theory. But again, it's just the theory. When we look at the Buddhist texts, we look at the teachings of the Buddha, and look at the life story of the Buddha, when after he stopped fasting and decided that he would eat again, regain his strength and go sit under the Bodhi tree, he saw visions of his past lives, one after the other. It was no longer a mythology, it was no longer a story or a tale. He witnessed it for himself. He not only saw his own past lives, and of course, like the rest of us, he had been in all of these different realms of rebirth. He had taken rebirth in the hell realms. We have the stories. He had taken rebirth as a hungry ghost, as an animal, uh, and as a god. We have these records in the sutras. And so, he, he told what he saw. And he saw not only his own rebirth, but he also saw the rebirth of the sentient beings who were cycling like one lifetime after another, again, again, again. And that's why he taught the Dharma. He wanted to help us get out of this wheel of rebirth and suffering. So when we think about it, we can reflect on our own sufferings in this lifetime. Not getting what we want. That's a big one, right? Because all the billboards, all the corporations are telling us what we should want. And then, if we're not too smart, we'll want it. Which is the design of the corporations, to get us to want these things and buy these things. And when we don't get them, we suffer. Then also, we get what we don't want. We slice our finger when we're making breakfast, we get catch cold, we get stomach aches. Um, our friends sometimes are not kind to us, right? Um, sometimes we don't get into the school we want, sometimes we don't get the job we want, we don't get the motor scooter we want. I mean, one thing after another, the suffering of not getting what we want and getting what we don't want. So these are the patterns. And this is why meditation on compassion is so important. Now we, who I assume are the privileged, you know, we've all had something to eat today, we'll probably have something to drink today, we're sitting in this beautiful monastery with the AC going, Right? Why should we care about suffering? Why should we generate compassion? Well, let me tell you, after 15 years in India, 
and many trips to Bangladesh, <coughs> Laos, Cambodia, Mongolia, and other countries. There's a lot of suffering in the world. Just some of us in India also. Every day we see people who don't have enough to eat. It's about 40% of the world's population are not getting enough food. Of those 40%, the majority are children, women and children, who don't have enough to eat. Imagine, here in Indonesia, this is snack paradise. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen any hungry people here. Even the beggars are you know, doing pretty good. Uh, people come along in their SUVs and give them snacks. And yeah, I'm sure there are people who are suffering from hunger here, but I just help them this community because Indonesian people are very kind and they're very generous. And so from what I've seen, even the poor have enough to eat. But in India, oh, let me tell you, there are people who are so skinny and like sick, including the children. And the only way many of them can get enough food to eat is to work on the roads. So they're from very warm areas, but they have to go up to the Himalayas and work on the roads. And they have to take our children, right? So along the roadside, some of you who have been to India will know that uh, the children are playing alongside the road and they have to spread the cloth to where so the sand, yeah? So it's important for us to think about that. Let's think about the mothers who didn't have to give birth to one child after another and see their children die from hunger. So I always get this image of the road workers in India. Let's talk about water. Here in Indonesia, I have yet to be in a place where there wasn't running water. Now we had some people who were complaining about no hot water. I said, hot water? Uh, that's a luxury. We lived in India for so many years and we're lucky to get water at all. Forget about running water. Forget about hot water. We're lucky to get water. We have to carry the bucket sometimes from a very long way to get even a drop of water. Then let's talk about climate change. Mm. The bad news is that in many places, the temperatures are going to rise by 4 degrees. Okay, so right now in India, people are dropping dead because of the heat. In some places, it's gone up to 48 degrees. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people dropping dead from the heat. If it goes up four more degrees, it would be 52 degrees. What does that mean for the people? Well, it's not just a matter of discomfort. Ooh, I feel so hot. No. Then there's no, when the heat goes that high, the temperatures go that high, it means that there's no water, no water to drink, and no water for the fields. If there's no water for the fields, that means there's no food. So this is the uncomfortable reality, what Al Gore called the inconvenient truth, that we all need to recognize. So as Buddhists, we're, when we are asked by the Lord Buddha to develop loving kindness and compassion, we have to look at these realities. The Buddha did not shy away from suffering. He put it first on the agenda, the first noble truth of the Buddha. And therefore, as the Buddhist disciples, we have no choice. We cannot hide close our eyes to the sufferings of the world. It's very important. We cannot progress on the path if we don't understand the basic nature of reality. The basic nature of reality is both a philosophical concept, which we can talk about, you know, emptiness and all that, but it also means looking at the reality of the human condition. Our condition, right? While we're young, we're having fun, we're wasting time, gossiping, shopping. But then, when we get old and sick, and fall and have all these problems, life looks very different. So we would be wise. The wise person will look at suffering now, 
develop compassion in them. It's a great opportunity. If we don't look at compassion and at the suffering, we won't be able to develop compassion. If we don't develop compassion, we won't be able to achieve awakening. The Buddha was very clear about how we get to enlightenment. And he talked about wisdom and compassion as the two wings of the bird that we use to fly to enlightenment. And one is compassion. So, you see the logic? In order to get enlightened, we have to develop compassion. In order to develop compassion, we have to look at dukkha. That's the deal. That's how it goes, right? Um, there's no third option. <laughs> so, okay, so even though it's an uncomfortable, inconvenient reality, it's very important that we meditate on compassion. So let's take a few minutes to meditate on the sufferings of the world. I've mentioned a few, and maybe you can think of more. So we're going to literally look at the sufferings of sentient beings, just for a few minutes, but so that we learn how we do this. How we develop compassion. Are you in? Okay. So sit comfortably. Sit tall, straight. Check your posture.
we can practice very nicely when we're feeling healthy and we have enough to eat and everything's going well and, you know, people like us and, you know, we're feeling pretty good and then we can sit and, and do all our, you know, mindfulness and practices and send out loving kindness and we feel pretty good. But then we find that we have some very serious sickness or someone we very much love, our parents or our partners, our children have some serious sickness or even they die and suddenly it's like the bottom has fallen out of our world. Suddenly we are filled with grief and, and pain and asking, why did this happen to me? And suddenly Dharma goes out the window. Forget about sitting and having compassion for others. What about me? I'm suffering. And so these teachings on Lojong, on, on food transformation, were methods for taking the really difficult things which happen to us in our life. Loss and people speaking badly of us and uh, sickness and all sorts of things which we don't want to happen. As like she said, you know, the Buddha described Dukkha as not only not getting what we want, but getting what we don't want. And instead of seeing these difficulties of life as an obstacle to our practice, we recognize them as the opportunity to practice, to really practice, to take all the difficulties that come to us in our life and use it on the path. And if we can understand how to do this, it gives us enormous inner courage. We no longer have so many hopes and fears. Hopes everything's going to go okay, fears that somehow it won't. Because we recognize that whatever happens, we can make use of it for, for inwardly growing ourselves and at the same time reaching out to benefit others. So this very powerful teaching on mind training or mental transformation, it's really not just about the mind and the intellect, it's about our attitude to life. Imagining like in the God realm that everything when it goes well, then that's a good thing. But in the end, we just end up being defenseless. When things go wrong, we, we are just spiritually very flabby. It's like if you lie around on the couch all day eating chocolates. Um, you know, that might seem like a nice thing to do, but then, you know, in the end, we, we just end up, um, you know, just getting overweight and, and flabby, and we need to go to the gym. You know, get on those machines and give ourselves a good workout, right? In order to get strong muscles. So we need strong spiritual muscles. And for that, we need difficulties, obstacles, problems. Instead of seeing that as the excuse not to practice, we recognize that this is our great opportunity really and truly become practitioners. So this was, uh, this method of looking at life was uh, learned by uh, Paladin Natisha when he came here to Indonesia and he carried it back to India and then he was invited to Tibet and he spent the rest of his life uh, in Tibet and, and teaching about the bodhicitta, about the aspiration for enlightenment, not just for ourselves, but for, in order to really be a benefit for all beings. And along with that, these teachings, which he handed down then to his students 
of how to take everything which life gives us and use it as our practice. So among the uh, many teachings which were then um, included in this uh, Mojong text. There are many very famous texts which uh, people up to today um, study and try to practice. But there's one technique which uh, is included in all these teachings and is very, very practical. And that is what in Tibetan is called Tongle. Tong means to send out, Len means to uh, accept in. And it's, as uh, the Venerable Lekshi said, it's, it's a method of making, a practical method for uh, cultivating loving kindness and compassion. I will uh, describe the meditation in a while, but I will talk here about a few of its applications. Um, for example, if we, somebody we know is, is sick and we go to visit them, and we, we sit there feeling kind of useless, we don't really know what to do, we feel very sorry, but we don't know how to help them. Well, one of the ways we can help them is just by sitting quietly. You don't have to sit in special posture, you know, breathing in and out, but just very relaxed, sitting there and doing this meditation for them. Or if we know someone, for example, who is sick, somebody, especially at the beginning, while we're learning this, this process, somebody we care about, because it, it has to come from the heart. So it's, you know, we need to practice first on someone, that a uh, close relation or a, a dear friend or, or someone that we have a heart connection with, who is suffering. They could be suffering physically, mentally, Psychologically, maybe their business has just collapsed and they're deeply depressed and worried. Whatever the problem is, somebody that we can think of, that we care about, who we can use as the object for this practice. And so then either we are, as I say, someone who is sick and we are visiting them, or just just thinking of them, visualizing them in front of us. If we have a photo, that can be very helpful. We can put the photo in front of us and look at that photo and imagine that the person is there in front of us at this moment. The Buddha, that when he spoke about loving kindness, said, just as a mother loves her child, her only child, so we must develop this feeling of great love for all beings, not just the child. But we start by practicing on someone, like a mother with a child, someone that, that we genuinely feel for. And so the, the basic meditation, it has various applications, but here, what we do? Imagine, all right, this, this vase of roses here is now going to transform into somebody whom I know is at this moment suffering. As I say, either physically, mentally, psychologically, however. They are truly suffering at this point. And from my point of view, I would really love them to be relieved of their suffering. So, we visualize that person sitting or lying in front of us. 
and with the in breath, with our inhalation, we visualize that we are taking in all of their suffering in the form of dark light or, or smoke, whatever is meaningful for you, sort of like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> right? We're getting rid of all the dust and dirt, not only of their present situation, but the karma which caused that. Because what happens to us, whether our suffering or our happiness, is due to prior actions, either from this lifetime or past lifetime. At some point, all of us, in our endless rebirths, have done just about everything. Good, bad, and indifferent. We have sown zillions of seeds from our intentional actions of body, speech, and mind. And we do not know when the causes and conditions are going to arise to cause certain seeds to rise up. So it's not a matter that if we meet with somebody who is sick, we say to them, but it's your own fault. Obviously, you did something bad in your past life, and now this is the result to that. With all the bad things, we don't know. So therefore, bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people, isn't it? You know, we've all done everything. And so, if we get a toothache, we don't have to say, well, this is the result of bad karma, therefore I'm not going to the dentist because this is all my own fault and I should just suffer until that karma is finished. <laughs> Do you think like that? So likewise, with others who are having sufferings, who are having problems, this is not the time to be judgmental. Who are we to be judgmental? It's a time for arousing compassion. And so, therefore, when we think of someone who is suffering, we think of them, and with the in-breath, we imagine taking in all their suffering, into ourselves in the form of dark light with the ingoing breath. And then this dark light comes down and it hits here in the center of our chest. Now, as the Venerable Lekshi mentioned, the obstacle for our compassion is what is called the self-cherishing mind. It's our selfish ego, which says, I'm really sorry you're suffering, but I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> okay? Many people, when we teach this practice, say, this is lovely, but it doesn't really work, does it? because they're very afraid that if they take on the suffering of others, maybe they'll get it. And so our self-cherishing mind says, no, I don't want it. You know, I mean, I really want you to be well, but I don't want your sins. Right? So this is very good practice because it really hits hard at that solid rock of our ego which is exactly what is preventing us from recognizing our Buddha nature. We think that the ego is going to be our friend, but actually the ego is the, our problem, the big problem. So this practice 
directly hits a bit. And the more it hurts, the more you're doing the practice right. Okay, if you don't feel this at all, you're probably either you're an eighth level bodhisattva or you're not really doing it properly. So this is again why we talk about a mother. Um, how much time do we have? Okay, so very quickly, I will give an, an, uh, an example. Um, when, when I was a little girl, when I was about seven or eight years old in London, um, I, I caught fire. Uh, my, my nylon dress hit against uh, um, an electric fire. And so I was all up in flames. And at that time, my mother, she was very ill. She had kidney stones, so she was also in a lot of pain. But fortunately, she was ill in her bedroom, otherwise I wouldn't be here talking to you because she would have been at work. So then I, I ran up the stairs, and I was screaming, of course, and I ran into the room, and then she saw me and, and put me out. She wrapped me in, in a sheet. And um, meantime, I, I went, uh, I separated from the body, and I was up on the ceiling looking down at my little body down there on the bed. And uh, all these beings of light were saying, come with us, come with us. And I thought, oh good, I'm going to die. Well, that would be interesting. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I mean, I definitely wanted to go with these beings of light. I did not want to go back down to my burnt out little body. But meantime, the neighbors had heard the screams. So they started coming in. And then I was back in my body again. And uh, the next thing I remember was being in hospital. And the doctors were saying to me, you're a very brave little girl. You must be in tremendous pain. My whole back was burned right off. My mother said it was one big blister. And we know, even if you burn just the tip of the finger, how painful it is. My whole back was burned off. And so the doctor said, you know, you must be in tremendous pain. And I said, no, there's no pain. You can look at me for a while. Yeah, she's a little girl, she doesn't understand the question. So I stayed in the hospital for many, many weeks. And, and then, you know, I, I was healed. I had no scars. Um, and there was no pain. They all thought I was just being very, very brave, very stoic. Years, I think I was too small to think about it. I didn't recognize that there was anything unusual. But many, many years later, when I grew up, I remembered that. And I said to my mother, you know, it's very strange. All that time in hospital, and I, I didn't feel anything. And she said, that when I was lying there on the bed unconscious, because I was up on the ceiling, she had prayed and said, please don't let her die. And please don't let her suffer. She's too young to suffer. Give all her suffering to me. I will take her suffering. And she would have. Even though she herself was in such pain with kidney stones, if she could have taken my pain too, she would have been so happy if I could have been relieved of that pain. And so because her, her prayer was so heartfelt and so true, I think for that reason, whoever took compassion and uh, relieved me of the pain, and, and of course, did not give it to my mother also. But it's that level of genuinely rejoicing if we could take the suffering of others that we are aiming for. Okay? So all of you who are mothers, you know, if your child was sick, you would be so happy if you could take their pain onto yourself and relieve them of that suffering.
So this is why the Buddha said, just as a mother loves